Well, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to give you a little time to to come in. I'm Virginia Robert. Uh, I'm the foreign desk editor for Les Echo, the French business daily. And uh, we're going to talk about a very incredible electoral year coming ahead. I hear an echo. Is that normal? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, Don't probably speak. normal. Not <laughs> Did you hear the echo too? Mm. No? The sound is very loud. Um, so to discuss this incredible year we have ahead of us, uh, I have with me um, Igor Jorgens, who's uh, from Russia. He's a man of insurance. He's been involved in the insurance industry for many years and uh, several associations. And he's also involved in the Russian International Affairs Council. Next to him is Isabelle Lasser, who is a journalist just like me. Uh, she's the diplomatic correspondent for Le Figaro, the French newspaper, very well known. She's been a defense uh, correspondent, diplomatic correspondent, foreign correspondent, war reporter. So she's done it about all. And she just wrote a, um, um, a book about Putin and uh, Macron that is uh, going uh, very well. The book is. Maybe not the relationship, but the book is doing very well. And next to me is uh, Hiroyu Akita, who is a senior writer for Nikkei. He publishes commentaries and columns on foreign affairs and security affairs. And uh, he's worked uh, all over the place, in London, in Washington, in Beijing. He's been a foreign correspondent, so he knows uh, foreign affairs very well. And behind us, I see Monsieur Gruffa, who joined us uh, finally through a video link. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, he's a banker. And he, I met him in, in New York when he was working for City at the time. And he's involved in, in many, many uh, different projects. So before we, we start the panel, I'd like to share with you um, a study that came out yesterday, actually. And it's a study published by International Idea, and that's an intergovernmental um, group that is based in Sweden and that monitors the, um, the state of democracy. And the findings are really pretty appalling because it, show, it shows that in 2022, the world has entered the longest democratic recession ever observed, which means that for the sixth consecutive year, democratic values are losing ground everywhere. And I mean everywhere, I mean in Europe, I mean in the Americas, in India, in Russia. And declines have occurred in the very foundations of democracy, revealing weaknesses in the electoral processes, in the ability of legislators to act as checks on executive overreach, and also the difficulty for people to access the institutions of justice. You have countries, for instance, like Tunisia, Afghanistan, Belarus, Nicaragua, or Myanmar, that have shown great recessions, regressions last year. And this institutional weakness is compounded by continuing declines in core democratic rights, including freedom of expression, freedom of association and, as and, and assembly, and sorry, and freedom of the press. And Europe, of course, is not immune because according to the report, the rule of law has weakened, and it won't surprise many of you, but in Hungary and <laughs> Austria, where freedom of expression falters, access to justice is more difficult in the UK as well as in France, where the freedom to assembly is also fading. Poland last year had many factors deteriorating, and the recent elections won by the opposition might, might pave the way for a betterment. So it is not an overstatement to say that globally, democracy now faces pressure everywhere, with authoritarian regimes tightening their grip, and too many elected leaders adopting authoritarian tactics to cling to control. Meanwhile, you have misinformation campaigns, political polarization, and rising inequality that erode people's trust in democracy. So, as you probably agree with me, it is of paramount importance that democracy shows their resilience. Not all political regions are equal. And next year's elections will show indeed if the democratic process is able to rebound. So to start the discussion, we're going to start with Isabelle, who will give us a roundup of this election year, so we have a good grasp of what is happening. 44 countries are going to have either a new president or a new parliament. We also have elections in, in Europe. So it's, it's something that is quite extraordinary. Yes. Um, 2024 will be an incredible year 
regarding uh, the elections organized absolutely everywhere. In India, the biggest democracy, in, of the, of the, in South Africa, in Iran, Brazil, Nigeria, Taiwan, Russia, maybe in Ukraine, and of course um, in, in Europe with the European elections. So, my, and, and USA, of course. Uh, my question would be, I mean, my, I will try to understand if, it's, uh, if the, all this election will be a continuity or a breakup regarding the major geopolitical trends uh, we've seen these last years in, in the world. My guess is that it will be continuity. Um, I mean, uh, except the USA elections, most of the elections in the world um, will have, I mean, the results will have a very low impact on the geopolitical trends we are uh, viewing today. Uh, Russian election, it's, I mean, no suspense. Iran election, very few suspense. Belarusian, the same thing. Um, I mean, the majority of the autocratic regime will uh, organize themselves to win the election. Uh, coming to the democratic countries, even if um, the power, the BJP in India is challenged, there's a few chance that uh, geopolitical, that the foreign policy of India, which is based on the multi-alignment, will be changed. Um, even which is not for example, which is not at the, at the moment the most uh, uh, probable. Even if in, in Taiwan, the DPP loses the election, and if the opposition, which uh, uh, is um, asking for uh, an appeasement politics toward China, even if they win, and I could just come back from Taiwan three days ago, and it's not what is expected. You, you will not see from one day to another Taiwan just becoming uh, again in the, in the China uh, area. The, the important elections have already been organized in 2023. In Europe, it's Poland and Slovakia, which has changed their uh, political drive and also uh, Turkey with the reconduction of Erdogan. Of course, you will tell me there's a big, an exception and a big exception, which is uh, the, the American election. And the perspective is tr if Trump is re-elected of uh, big consequences, first, on the help to Ukraine, and second, on the future of NATO. But even that is not sure because um, can we uh, really expect Donald Trump to um, sell off the future of the Western world by cutting from one day to another the help to Ukraine? I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, my point would be that even if Trump is re-elected, is elected, um, is coming back next year, in uh, Washington, it will, um, I mean, this election will be only an accelerator to the trends, the geopolitical trends which still exist. And these trends are not at all in favor of the Western world. If you liked 2023, you will definitely love 2024, because on the menu we have the generalization of the use of force, which uh, month after month is replacing the rule of law. We'll have um, the continuing of the collapse of the, of the international order from 1945, and with it, the um, international in institutions, which were a guarantee for peace, like UN, and also the disarmament uh, treaty. We'll also have new challenges to the Western world, the continuing of the decrease of democracies, 
um, and the um, augmentation of the of the autocracies uh, will have the cont continuation of the split of the world in two parts, not camp, but part or much more family. One is the South Global and the other is the uh, Global North. And whatever the election, the result of the election will be uh, in India, in South Africa, in, uh, in Russia, uh, even in the States, this trend will, will continue and will be boosted. So for me, as a uh, Western journalist traveling all around, um, more than the elections, the determining influence on the geopolitical trends in 2024 will be um, who's going to win the war between Russia and Ukraine, and uh, secondly, what will be the consequences of the war between Israel and Hamas. And meanwhile, waiting um, for a uh, next international order, international order with new rules that everybody will have to work on. Uh, the previous one will continue to collapse and we'll have a more crisis to come in this world which is becoming a jungle. One may be the crisis between Taiwan and China, others could happen in the Balkans, and of course in, uh, in Africa. I will end by a sentence of uh, Joe Biden. Yesterday he was having a conversation with the president of Chile, and here's what he said. He said, in my view, um, there comes a time, maybe every six to eight generations, where the world changes in a very short time. Here we are, and I think what happens in the two, three years are going to determine what the world looks like for the next five or six decades. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So a very defining moment, but not especially com coming from the elections, as you said, because the most important ones were this year, Poland, um, Slo Slovakia. Uh, Slovakia, of course. Um, nevertheless, there's the big one next year that everybody's looking at, and it's 2024. I'm turning to you. Actually, I'm seeing you here too, Jean-Claude. So maybe we can have a highlight on what is happening in the United States and uh, where, where the debate is going right now. The floor is yours. Good morning, good evening. Hope you can hear me well. I wish I could be with you. Unfortunately, okay. when I was about to board my flight, I had a slight health issue to deal with. And unfortunately, I couldn't board the flight. And I miss so much being with you and networking with many of you who are long-term friends. My apologies. I will try to cover in a few minutes uh, what you, I guess, expecting me to talk about, uh, which is the US presidential election. And I would say more generally, the election in November 2024 both from the domestic standpoint, but also from the point of geopolitical environment. Uh, you know what's happening in uh, November 2024, which is almost exactly a year from today. The president will be elected for four years. The House of Representatives will be elected for two years. And in the Senate, 33 senators, which is about one third, will be elected for a period of six years. Let's deal with uh, the Senate and the uh, House of Representatives uh, 20 Democrats and three independents that normally caucus with Democrats are standing for re-election. Some of them are not standing for re-election, but say those are the seats. And then uh, 10 Republicans. Uh, so the total of 33. The forecast at the moment is that 14 are solid Democrats, one is leading Democrats, five are leading likely Democrats, and three so-called toss-up where the result will depend on the day of the election. And the Republicans are almost all likely to be re-elected. Uh, there could be a change of majority in the Senate, but right now, as you know, there is a majority of Democratic senators, 51 to 9, and there is the casting vote of the vice president. So the Senate could be changing majority. It will largely 
depend on what I call the coattail effect of the presidential election. The House of Representatives, 435 members, 221 Republican, 212 Democrats, that since the last midterm election in November, exactly a year ago, and two seats are vacant. My prediction is that after the zoo that we've seen for the election of the speaker, it's very unlikely that the Republican will be able to uh, keep the majority in the House, and uh, the House could again become democratic by a slight majority. So we are now in the period where each party, and as you know, there, there might be several candidates, but at the end of the day, the two parties, the United States, Democrat and Republican, and we are the time where each of them is choosing their own <clears throat> candidate for next year election. The president, this is the tradition, whether it's Republican or Democrat, a president with what we call an incumbent is likely to stand without being challenged for re-election. Yet, Joe Biden is facing some opposition for a variety of reasons within his own party. First of all, his age. If he's elected in November next year, he will uh, assume his function at the beginning of 2025, and he will be 82 years old. And when he finishes mandate, he will be 86. He will be the oldest president in the history of the United States. He's also facing other issues. He's facing issues of his vice president, Kamala Harris, who's never been convincing and who's not liked and respected even by his own, by our own party, the Democratic Party. She's never been able to impress. And as you know, I mean, if something happens to the president, Kamala Harris immediately steps in and becomes the next president. Americans, starting with the majority of Democrats, are very uncomfortable with that. And then he has issues with his son and the business, I would say, business activities of his family. Uh, so it, the matter is, it, it's quite simple. The people know that he will be, unless something happens to him between now and the election, he will be the candidate for the Democratic Party. Yet this is not the candidate that the Democratic Party would like to have. Biden was elected in 2020, largely because he was the alternative to uh, Bernie Sanders that pe people find too left in, and therefore, uh, and he didn't really campaign, and he was lucky to face Trump, who had a lot of issues. So uh, he was elected. This time, it's going to be much tougher. So people are not convinced that Biden is candidate to uh, face Trump, assuming Trump is the nominee <laughs> of the Republican Party. Now, let's switch to the Republican Party. Uh, same story on the Republican Party. Trump is leading in the polls, but effectively, only 40% of the people who are at the primaries, and I, I remind you, at the primary, only vote the people who are as Republican or Democrat. So if you you can vote at the Democratic primary. If you're Republican, you get a Republican primary. But those who are independent, and most of the, the majority of Americans are neither Republican nor Democrat. They are registered as independent. Trump only gets 40% or less of Republican voters. 60% don't want Trump. Now, the problem is that they don't agree with relative to Trump. So Trump is, like Biden, not the candidate of the party as it stands now, at, at least the majority of the Republican voters. For about, first of all, his personality. I mean, some people and quite a few people don't like his personality, his style, uh, his attitude, and so on and so forth. Then he has a lot of legal issues to deal with. I mean, personal issues, you know, sexual assault, but also he took some classified documents when he had function and brought them to his, his Florida and really stopped and didn't dare and lie about it. Then he reached the election. Then there was this uh, famous January 6, 21, when there was an assault on the Capitol, which shocked a lot of people in the world, but shocked a lot of people as well. So, uh, and I can go on and on and 
and Trump essentially is perceived as a negotiating person. He has done a number of things when he was president because he, he, he followed some of his advisors, some advisors who were better than some others. But net-net, people don't feel that Trump, who is also not so much younger, I mean, maybe a couple of years than Biden, is the, is the American would like to have as the next president. So, so what could be the outcome? You know? my, my view is that it's going to be Trump, Biden, certain. So, uh, as I said, could have health issues and other issues between now and the election and be replaced by a governor. Not, not this for sure. And Trump is facing challenges. And although he leads in the polls, he leads in Iowa, he leads in New Hampshire, he leads also in South Carolina. Two alternatives are waiting in the wings. Governor of Florida, Ron Personally, uh, Ron DeSantis won his election during uh, the election of 2020. I don't think that, uh, I mean, it was a very significant, but he's done a number of missteps since he elected, and his campaign is not going well. So uh, he's relatively strong, could be that with Trump. Now I see him sort of gradually fading away. So the star in the Republican Party, but he's uh, Governor Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina, who was also ambassador to the United Nations, originally a family from India, a Sikh family from India, and she, they came to the United States. She was a, locally in South Carolina, had a sort of one and a half term as governor of the state, and was appointed by the ambassador to the UN, she did an effective job, what I would call the Reaganian part of the party, the traditional Republican, who are strong on foreign policy, free market, and limited government. So I would say a traditional. She was loyal to Trump when she was doing her job for the United At the same time, she was able to take positions that are less rigid and less conservative than some other uh, Republican, particularly on the critical in the United States with women rights, including right to abortion. As so, you know, the majority of American people are in favor of abortion, not any abortion, not for an extended period of time, but the majority of Americans are in favor of abortion. It so happens that the majority of the Republican party is so-called life, and okay. this is conflicting with the view of the majority. Thank you. So that, that was the first round. I I it for, you were very for. long already, and we're going to come back with more questions. So if you don't mind hanging up with us for a little while longer, just to answer questions later of on, course, of because <laughs> we need we need time for everybody here. So now we have the basics: Biden on one side, Trump the other. Nikki Haley's climbing up. Some of you have some hopes for her, but we're not sure. But there are a lot of things to talk about, and especially how geopolitics are getting into this, uh, this election, which never happens. And I know you're keen to talk about this a little later. But it's going to be to have interesting for us to have okay. other perspectives sure. on this election. And uh, with Mr. Akita, he's going to give us his view of how Asia is seeing this, this uh, election coming up and what it means for, for Asian countries, and also maybe allude also to Taiwanese elections. Okay, thank you very much for having me. <coughs> uh, since I'm from uh, one of the uh, most dangerous geostrategic location, uh, surrounded by Russia, North Korea, and China, and Japan is just next to uh, Taiwan Strait and Korean Peninsula, and Russia has been occupying uh, Japanese territory for about uh, 70 years. So please allow me to be a, a bit, allow me to present a bit pessimistic view. In that context, I'd like to make uh, uh, three points. One is uh, about the prospect of U.S. presidential election. I don't go, go into a detail because, you know, he... Yeah, and yeah, gave he, us a lot yes. of details. Then, secondly, uh, its implication, U.S. presidential election implication for Asia or for U.S. allies and partners. And then, thirdly, uh, about the Taiwan presidential election next January. So first, prospect of U.S. presidential election. I traveled to uh, southern part of the U.S. last month, like Georgia, 
to meet many Mr. Trump's supporter, supporters, and I did. And that reminded me that two things. One, they are very, very serious. They are seriously supporting Mr. Trump. But more importantly, uh, many people say that U.S. economic situation is terrible. Though objective economic data says unemployment rate is quite low, and the U.S. economy is kind of growing. Mm -hmm. So I asked the uh, political scientists about it, and they say it is by, uh, by partisan bias. So people do not accept objective data anymore. So this means that I think that U.S. election next year is not a topic to analyze based on objective data, because people don't buy it. But rather, it is, de facto a political civil war. Oh. So political, if it is a political civil war, uh, maybe a prospect would be very, very highly polarized, and whether Mr. Biden or Mr. Trump will win, it's going to further deepen the division of the United States. So that is my first prospect mm -hmm. on the US presidential election. And secondly, uh, second point, implication of US presidential election to the uh, US allies. Whether Mr. Trump will become president or not, I think that uh, US election will further accelerate so-called plan A dash trend. Plan, plan A, Plan A world, is the world in which U.S. maintain dominant power mm -hmm. and strong leadership, so that U.S. allies or partners could cheap riding on U.S. security umbrella or U.S. rely on U.S. leadership. That is a Plan A world, but the maybe first Trump administration brought world to plan A dash world. So we are now at the plan A dash world. That is, uh, US allies or partner still keep relying in on US military presence or leadership to some extent, but the, they realize that plan A is not the sustainable anymore. So make more effort to defend itself or to make more security con or military contribution to sustain U.S. military commitment. For example, Japan made a decision to launch biggest military build-up after World War II, uh, namely uh, double its defense budget within five years. And also Japan reached out to, uh, reaching out to Australia, U.K., South Korea, France to enhance security cooperation to support or complement U.S. military presence in, in, the, in, in, in the Pacific. So I think that uh, U.S. presidential election will be highly polarized. And if, of course, it is, if Mr. Trump gets elected, the world will further accelerate the shift from Plan A to Plan A dash. But even if Mr. Biden gets elected, People, it will highlight how U.S. will be, uh, U.S. have to change, challenge, uh, face the challenge internally. So I think uh, regardless who will be, uh, get elected, the world will accelerate. Uh, it, plan A dash trend. But for the country, who can, but some of the country, maybe plan A dash, that is to, sustain U.S. military commitment or leadership. Will even, maybe for some country, it will not be possible. Maybe Middle East, the U.S. is reducing footprint. So for that country, next year will be the beginning of the real Plan B world. So my point is that shift from Plan A to Plan A dash or Plan B world. So that is the second point. And third, and last point is about the Taiwan presidential election. 
uh, next January. I think that whether ruling parties candidate or opposition parties candidate win, there will be a common ground. That is a status quo, maintenance of status quo. Okay. Uh, according to a public poll, majority of Taiwan people really wants to maintain status quo. So if ruling party candidate win, maybe they try to, he will try to keep a distance from mainland China, but will not call for independence. <laughs> if opposition party leader will win the, pre win the presidency, maybe he will try to embrace more dialogue with China, but will not embrace China's economic or political sphere of influence to the extent to change the status quo. So that is a prediction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's interesting because Isabel said these elections are not really going to count because it's not going to change much uh, afterwards because what matters is what's going to happen on the battlefield in Ukraine and in uh, Israel. And you're saying that whatever the elections are going to bring about in the States, definitely we're going to see a, uh, an importance lessening for the United States Sl as, as the big ally. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to turn to Igor, who's Russian. So he's going to talk to us about his view of the American elections, but also talk to us about the Russian election, because Putin should announce very soon that he's a candidate, which should not be a big surprise. Uh, but how is it viewed from the inside, especially when a war is going on, people and soldiers are killed? How does he present himself to, to the Russians? And, and, and your take on the American elections also. Thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs> Thierry de Montbrial, because from 2008, being a participant of the World Policy Conference, that's, that's worth a, a, an award. Uh, there is no suspense in Russian election. Eh? Uh, if it takes place on March 2024, as it is planned, 80% of the population, or those who will come to vote, will, will vote for, for Mr. Putin. Okay? Uh, this is the genesis of the system, this is the history, this is the geopolitical situation. Uh, having said that... War doesn't uh, change that. Having said that, uh, unfortunately, they didn't give me a clicker, and I had some slides, but you have to believe uh, me. Yeah. You have to believe me that uh, sociology shows that, number one, among young people, there is a big fatigue of the face, uh, because Mr. Putin is in power for, for the last 23 years, and it's obvious then that uh, uh, some young people want to change. Second, even if something happens, something very unexpected, and then uh, Mr. Putin, for example, says that I'm not running. Uh, the same young people are divided into two equal uh, categories. One would say we want a stronger military to head us, and another one ferociously saying no military at all, we need some peaceful and, and civil development of, of, of Russian Federation. So here you have a split even among the young category of the voters. Forget about the older ones who would 60% vote for somebody with the military background to, to head them. Okay, so this is the second. Both of them, both categories and both age groups would vote for more social justice. And the talk about the progressive income tax, which is going on for, 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 for decades, and we still have a flat 13% uh, uh, income tax. Uh, the, 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 the talk about the uh, oligarchs who are around the, the Kremlin and they run the country and, and not us running the country, and so on and so forth. So uh, whoever wins uh, should take this into very serious consideration. Uh, very telling was the reply, uh, what about the mutiny of certain Mr. Prigozhin? Probably you heard of the mutiny this summer when uh, somebody very close to, to power, the owner of the private army who fought in Syria, in Ukraine, all of a sudden raised up and from Rostov on Don went to Moscow and was stopped only 110 kilometers from Moscow. So the reply of both young and old was 50% supported them. 
That's telling in terms of the general mood of those who are going to go and vote. Okay, so this is, the, this is it. You have to take con into consideration the feeling of social injustice, the, the need for change, at least in the younger uh, part of our population, and nevertheless, strong hand, and preferably something military, uh, somebody military uh, on top of us. Uh, again, I will end up this part by saying that 80% of those who will come will vote for Mr. Putin. It's organized, but it's also uh, genuine uh, support for the figure who is, who is leading the country at the moment. Uh, very strong and influential people around him, around Putin and visible on, uh, uh, on the political screen and political stage of our country, they say, why do we need election anyway? 80% is a given. Uh, the support is a given. We're in the war. Why bother? Why, why do we disattract attention of the people? Uh, I would say that Putin will not buy this because he needs a referendum on what's going on. So he will probably need a, a real and clean results from the different territories. We don't forget that Russia is one-seventh of the land mass with hundred nations and nationalities. It's very telling and interesting to know who reacts on what and how at this present stage of the serious geopolitical conflict. So it's like a survey for him. It is a survey, survey and a referendum <laughs> for him and for people around him who run the country uh, in his name or together with him. Having said this, I should say that given the circumstances, about 30% of this survey, 30% of those in, who participated in the sociological poll, they didn't know that we are having the election and didn't care less. And so from this point of view, this indifference also is very important to take into consideration for anybody who is doing the, the, the politological uh, management of the situation. <laughs> in, in view of this, uh, American election is, is of more <laughs> hype and interest uh, for the average uh, uh, Russian than, than probably ours. And from this point of view, there is no question that the mainstream uh, media is for Trump. Whether they are given a sort of advice or that's their honest uh, opinion, uh, no, no matter. But it's obvious from all of the analysis of the mainstream, I'm not talking about telegram channels and social media, but uh, the mainstream would, would definitely uh, provide all kind of support to Trump and all kind of... Uh, Oh, he's old, he's falling from the tar market, etc., etc., to Biden. It's obvious. Same would happen in French election if, hap if it happens tomorrow. Same kind of arguments will be in, for, in favor of Le Pen and against uh, uh, Macron. Uh, if the, the decision of uh, uh, Great Britain on participation in EU would happen tomorrow, uh, they would be for Farage. And, and, and against uh, anybody who, who is Eurocentric. So th that's obvious, that's the result of the geopolitical situation. And uh, again, no matter what, after March 24, if everything goes according to the normal plan, uh, very serious messages will be delivered to Kremlin to take care of uh, what's going on. And from this point of view, uh, of course, we are now junior partner of Chinese People's Republic, and certain elements will definitely be taken care of, not only in Moscow, but in Beijing too. So big reshuffle of the political staff, is that what you're saying? We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, we, in terms of reshuffle, they talk about reshuffle all the time, but we know that Mr. Putin is very loyal to his uh, and to his entourage, I don't think I don't think of great reshuffle, but the accents should be should be changed seriously. Well, thank you for for this assessment, Jean Claude. I know you're back. I don't know if they can put you back on the screen behind us, but uh, I wanted to ask you. Yes, I'm you're here. back here. Yeah. Um, you had disappeared for a while. Um, we, you, when we talked over the phone, you said that something that never happened in U.S. elections before was the theme of foreign policy becoming of importance to Americans, and that usually never happens. 
but this time, because of the war in Ukraine and because of what's happening with Israel and the Hamas, <coughs> it has become a big um, challenge for the politicians. Can you tell us a little more about this, <coughs> please? Yes. Uh, traditionally, I would say there is a consensus between the Republican and the Democrat on foreign policy. And uh, I heard what some of the panelists were saying about the quasi-civil war in the United States. This is true that we have a bipolarization of American politics, but uh, this bipolarization is no longer just on domestic issues, it's also on foreign issues. And uh, let's talk about uh, Ukraine for, for a period of time. When uh, Russia invaded Ukraine a year and a half ago, there was immediately an overwhelming support to help Ukraine and not getting involved directly, obviously, in, in a war, but <laughs> providing massive support, financial support, but also military support. And uh, this military support has been overwhelmingly support at the beginning, endorsed by, I would say, both sides, the Republican and the, the Democrat. But over time, we've seen gradually less support from some part of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is not just one block. You have, I would say, the Trump minority. You have the traditional isolationists who are not supporting foreign uh, involvement and that's led by people like Rand Paul. And then you have, I would say, the Reaganian part with Nikki Haley, but also people like uh, Tim Scott and uh, Mike Pence and so on, who want the United States to be involved and play a role, if not dominant, at least significant in, in foreign policy. That's until very recently, Biden has been able to get from Congress, both the House and the Senate, the financial help that he needs. And let's face it, you know, very cynically, you might say, the United States has been benefiting from the war in Ukraine for three reasons. First of all, remember some time ago, your French president was saying NATO is brand dead. I mean, NATO has never been stronger. That's one fact. And two major countries who had stayed neutral since World War II are now joining NATO, Sweden and Finland, which is extremely significant. So NATO has never been stronger. And the countries that are on the border of Russia wants NATO to be more involved, to protect them, because they believe that if Ukraine falls, they're likely to be the next target. So that's number one. Number two, the money that has been spent by the United States is coming back in the form of military uh, orders. You see, for example, when Germany who was not spending that much on defense, but Japan as well and so on, <laughs> where, who are they buying from? From the United States. So uh, they're not buying from Europe. They're buying from the United States. There are very few examples. So, and third, on the energy side, US, which is more or less self-sufficient, and Trump played a role for that, is now supplying Europe with the natural gas that they used to get from, from Russia. So the United States has been benefiting from this war from an economic standpoint and from a strategic standpoint. At the same time, there's less and less support for additional head to Ukraine, simply because this war is lasting longer than many people were expecting. And there is no obvious solution in the very near future. We know that Trump would probably drop to a significant extent the American help to Ukraine. But part of the Democrats are also now more hesitant. And one reason is simply the fact that we now have this war in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. And Again, there's no consensus on this war. You've seen people on the right and on the left being reluctant. Biden has been extremely supportive of the Israeli uh, counteroffensive on Hamas and the ground invasion in Gaza. But at the same time, part of the 
Democratic Party, the left wing part of the Democratic Party, is now voicing some disagreement. And Biden, to be elected, needs to have the vote of these people. As you know, I mean, there's no Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren running against him. He's unopposed from a practical standpoint. It doesn't mean that he may not lose vote. That could be critical in some states if the war lasts for too long and if the civilian casualties in Gaza become, I would say, unbearable. So we have a situation where, yes, the next presidential election in the U.S. could have significant impact. The question of Taiwan is very critical. There is a minority of people in the United States who would support an American involvement should China attack Taiwan in the very near future. But this is only a minority. The Americans feel in majority that they can only get involved in a foreign war or foreign conflict if there is a significant component in the American society that supports this involvement. That was the case, for example, during the uh, Ireland-UK uh, conflict. There was always a support for the Irish side on the American because of the large Irish community. Okay, so, so what the you say? Uh, Jewish community in the United States, you're probably aware of that. You know how many Jewish people in the United States? 7.6. <laughs> There's more Jewish people in the United States than in the state of Israel. The state of Israel has a population of, of uh, 9 million people, but only 43% are Jewish people. So we are in a situation where there is, and in New York City where I live, one, I mean 1.6 million people are part of this Jewish population. The Muslim population in the United States is three and a half million people. And the Muslim population is not just Arab. There are people coming from Africa, there are people coming from Iran, there are people coming from Somalia and Egypt and so on. You also have 3.5 million Arab people. So, but in 2050, the projection is that there will be 8 million Muslims in the United States, which means that the Muslim population would surpass the Israeli population. Bottom line, I think this election in November might see some shift of vote based on consideration of what's happening in Taiwan, what's happening in Ukraine. But frankly speaking, if you watch American TV and listen to the news and read the newspapers these days, nobody talks about Ukraine anymore. We used to have Ukraine all over the screen. Now it's all about Gaza, Israel, this. And this is a real concern, I know, for, this, for the Ukrainian government. Because the uh, new speaker is pushing some funding, but the, he's separating. Biden wants a package to support Ukraine and Israel. And, and the Republicans say, no, we should split. We should vote on the help to Israel and we should vote on the head to uh, Ukraine. And we know why they do that, because they're probably not likely to support additional money for Ukraine. It's interesting to see that, as in Russia, somehow the elections are going to be a survey of what people think, and especially regarding foreign affairs in the United States, which is something we really didn't have a big grasp on up, to the, up, up until now. If there are any questions in the room, I think we have 20 minutes. Yeah, there are a couple. So if you can bring a mic, somebody, please. So I, I see two. Um, there's one gentleman in the, Monsieur Fouché, and another gentleman in the, in the back. Excuse me. Okay. Um, yeah, if you can raise your hand. Uh, it's, oh, can you give it to Monsieur Fouché, please? Là, devant. <laughs> Sorry, next time. Sorry. Okay. A former ambassador and a géographe uh, de renom. <laughs> A short question to Jean-Claude. Do you see an alternative candidate on the side of the Democratic Party who would be the equivalent of Nikki Haley for the Republican Party? Thank you. 
short answer to your question, governor of California or governor of Michigan? That would be Gavin Newsom, the governor of California? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So there's a question over there, uh, the lady with the mic. And I think the young man, want, you had a question too, right? Okay. Thank you. I'm Daniel Andler from Paris, Sorbonne. Um, I'm dumbfounded that none of you ever mention the role of social media and the role of artificial intelligence in the amplification of well-known uh, propaganda uh, tricks. I mean, uh, the, 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 the journalist from Japan said people are immune to uh, rational arguments. Not so much. I'm not so convinced. They're not immune to propaganda when it's done in a certain industrial way. Anyway, whatever your opinion are, is on this important and well-known topic, uh, what, what you think about it and what, you think the, what, what is going to be the role of these uh, AI-powered uh, propaganda systems for the coming elections. Well, this is the perfect timing for a question because this was actually one of my questions, but I'm very glad you brought the topic. So, what the power of generative, generative AI. Do you think, like, for instance, politician should have some kind of uh, transparency during the elections, saying, now this is our roadmap, we're not going to use AI, or if we use AI, that's how we're going to do it. Uh, is this something that should come up now in the political discourse and campaigning? So maybe uh, Mr. Akita? Um, yes, I think that uh, uh, it is a very, very serious problem, and I think there should be some uh, restriction. Um, because the situation is that uh, political landscape is polarized, but also, especially in the US, I can feel that there is a huge polarization of media itself. So when I turn on the CNN, I list, you know, I watch some t news program, but when, then I turn to uh, Fox News, it's totally parallel world, and then I switch to another one. So I think that the even objective uh, broad TV program uh, provide different angle. So uh, without any restriction on the free flow of information in uh, unrestricted uh, cyberspace, it is very, it will create, amplify very chaotic uh, situation and it can be easily disrupted or manipulated by some actor. Say that. So, Igor, I'd like to have your take on this because you know there's a lot of accusations against Russian trolls during the elections, especially in 2016 in the yeah. States. What do you answer to this question? Because it's a real fear. Yeah, since um, the official election is overly organized and fully controlled, then in the mass social media, you have a lot of different uh, uh, opinions, some of them very exotic, some of them goes a little bit, you know, uh, beyond uh, reasonable, etc., etc. Uh, the only effort which I know of during the last election when opposition called for voting on anybody, be it communist, socialist, or extreme uh, rightist, but who are against the ruling party, Edina Russia. okay? So this experiment ended up in 1%, 1.5% of the result, you see? So from this point of view, when the country is organized like we are organized, and when the election is controlled the way we are controlled, then this effort of social media, a lot of noise, no, no uh, e efficient electoral result. That's well, that, number one. But for number two, number two, number two, a lot of people left <coughs> our country after, especially young, productive, creative, left after the beginning of, of the conflict with Ukraine. They are split altogether. We were discussing with some of them today. They are split and they don't have unity at all. They keep accusing each other in all kinds of mistakes rather than mobilizing for one candidate who would represent a real opposition. Well, maybe, Isabel, you could address this as a journalist when you cover foreign elections. The fact that now we have to be eager 
of so many fake news going around that the elections and the freedom of speech is really manipulated. Uh, it's making it very complicated for journalists to work. Uh, what do you think of it? Well, it's m one more argument to go uh, on the ground and not to cover elections through social um, uh, resort. But uh, I mean, I think it's one of the uh, weaknesses of uh, democracy. Countries like Russia and China have been uh, investing for years in warfare and uh, cyber uh, initiatives. Um, the elections in, in Europe uh, and the, in the States have been act for uh, for years and you have this uh, i mean europe is j is just uh, uh, realizing it uh, you know for now two or three years but the ch i mean uh, the, the changes come v very slow for years we have considered that in the cyber area for example the our purpose as the democratic countries was not uh, to have an attack department in the cyber area, but only a defense department. So I think we have 10 or, and I mean, for, for it's, it's also, um, we have not in, in, in invested in this area for uh, also for, for moral reasons, you, you know. Uh, so it's very difficult today to be, I mean, to, to, to be if, uh, to, to protected with efficiency. I, I just come back from, from Taiwan, and this is very interesting because Taiwan is uh, subjected uh, each, during each elections uh, by um, cyber attack from China, um, influences through the North medias Korea. of the Kuomintang and the, you know, f paid by, by, by China. And this year, they succeeded to, uh, to low down the level of uh, fake news by um, forbidding the, um, I mean, uh, you, you know, the, the system was that China was influencing um, the Taiwanese people through, uh, by investing in the religious um, uh, institutions. So um, Taiwan succeeded to, to cut the, the transfer of money coming from China to Taiwan. So this year, you have a decrease of, uh, I think, 40 or 50 percent of the Chinese influence directly in the, in, the, in the Taiwanese influence. So this is an example, but we are, we are far away, you know, uh, of what should be needed to do. I know that in France, I mean, we're just starting, and you said we have a very defensive position yeah. right now, yeah. not offensive at it's all. It's a because, taboo, it's a taboo. Boy, it's, uh, so I know there was another question. Uh, I, I don't know if you have a microphone. Oh, and there's one just... Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Does it work? Yes. Um, John Andrews here from The Economist. A question for Jean-Claude. Um, is it plausible that uh, Joe Biden can somehow persuade Kamala Harris with a good job offer not to be his running mate? And if so, does he need to find a black woman as her replacement? Um, and clearly Gavin Newsom would not be such a woman. And if you take the Republican side, um, do, do, you, do you think Nikki Haley is actually basically running to be Trump's uh, running mate? Okay, uh, <clears throat> I think it's too late for Biden to replace Kamala Harris. He's made the announcement Kamala Harris will be running with Biden if Biden is the nominee, as it likely to happen for the Democratic Party. So uh, if Biden wanted to replace Kamala Harris, it would have been done months ago, essentially when he announced his candidacy. So she's the candidate for vice president and people, and this is frankly speaking, one of the arguments that the Republican will be and should be using. When you look at Biden, the way he behaves, what he says, the way he express himself, people have to think that Kamala Harris is likely to be the next president. I wish him well, but Kamala Harris is likely to be the president that the democratic party will elect if they vote for Biden. 
That's number one. Now, <clears throat> you uh, asked the question. I had the privilege of meeting twice Nikki Haley when she started the campaign during uh, fundraising events in New York. And I had conversation one-to-one -one with her. And she said it very, very publicly. She said, I'm running for president. I'm not running to be the vice president. And I truly believe her. I think, let's frank, you know, she's 53, 54. If she doesn't make it this time, she has a very good chance of being the nominee for the next election. Four years from now, she will be 57, 58. So uh, I, she, she, Trump is likely to be the nominee of the Republican Party. Trump will obviously choose someone to be his vice president. Uh, good luck to the person that who's going to be chosen by Trump, because uh, this is this election is a toss-up. I, I have absolutely. If you look at the polls, you know, forget about the primaries. If you look at the polls, it's really very very close and. And so many things can happen between now and the election, particularly for Trump, also, who facing so many issues. And Biden, you know, inflation, the southern border, the problem with the, the family. So the fact of the matter is that, frankly speaking, Trump thinks only about himself and uh, he doesn't care. He will have a vice president candidate. It's very unlikely to be Nikki Haley or, or Ron DeSantis for that matter. It will be somebody else. It could be a governor uh, of uh, the state of, I'm not sure if it's South, uh, I forgot her name. You know I mean, the governor of North Dakota or South Dakota was a woman, uh, not an African-American, uh, is a white woman, but she's a governor and she's very popular in some conservative movement. I forgot her name, uh, skipped my mind, but I'm sure you can find her. I think she's the governor of, South Dakota. Okay, so we have to look for Nico Halley, but four more years. I think there is another question. Uh, that's what I think, yeah. Yeah, that's what you said, yeah. Um, I saw somebody else, yeah, some hands are raised in the back, please. Uh, somebody's going to bring you a mic. Axel. Hello, I'm Axel uh, Gilden from the French magazine L'Express. Uh, to follow up on this question, is there a, is there a scenario where Joe Biden steps down before summer. And um, the conven it happens the old way. In the, the convention decides for, for a new candidate. Or uh, Joe Biden has to, to he's impeached because he's, he's sick or something. What happens then? Another scenario for Biden? Uh, impeachment, I don't believe it. I mean, uh, impeachment is not for sickness. If, if it's impeachment, it's it, the Democrat are able to link the fundraising of his family. Uh, there's two checks have been produced where he received 10% of amount of money uh, received by his brother and his son. But it was mark loan repayment. So, I mean, I don't, Biden is not going to be impeached. There's not going to be enough evidence to, and I, I'm not sure if he's really corrupted. I mean, the family has been trying to use his name for benefiting by getting money from uh, shady characters in foreign countries, whether it's Romania, uh, Russia, China, and so on and so forth. They've been, all people do that in the political scene in the United States. They've done it to an extent that's unprecedented, but uh, that's not going to be enough. No, the only thing that could prevent him from being the nominee would be his health. If he had a major health issue, he may have to step down, but that's the only reason why I would see him. Otherwise, he's going to, you know, there's some, I just learned yesterday, for example, that, you know, you have to register in every state for the primaries and so on. He's not even registering for primary in New Hampshire. He's taking for granted that he will be the nominee of the party. So only a, a, a significant health issue would prevent him from being the nominee. But that, that's what usually happens when you have an incumbent president. He, you know, he doesn't go through the primary process. Uh, Alors, you want to follow up? And I think somebody else has a question behind you, if you just, can pass the mic afterwards. Just go to clarify, it. I just yeah. meant impeached by his health. I didn't mean impeached for uh, judicial yeah. region, <laughs> reasons. No, 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 no. Okay, no, no, I take it, I take it. And my answer to you is that 
that's the only reason why he wouldn't stand if, if he had a major health issue. And in the back, there's another question. Yes, hello, Nicola Pure from Tilt Capital. Thank you very much, very insightful. Maybe a question drawing on Ms. Lasser's point on continuity. Um, is it correct to read what is happening right now in 2024 being maybe a step in this direction that there is a, I would say, a continuity towards a, a big move globally towards far-right extremism, which is in fact fueled by fake news and social media, etc. How do we get out of that? To be frank, as a citizen, European citizen, I'm extremely concerned <clears throat> by the fact that every time we move and we see a scandal in the, in the sense of manipulation, it goes in the direction of far-right extremism. and It's very hard to fight on a, on a rational basis the arguments of this, uh, of this trend. Thank you. Well, the fact that there's more and more uh, votes for populist uh, uh, candidates in, in general. Each time you have a new scandal, it brings out more nationalism and populism. But it, it's, it's often true, but it's not always the case. Like what we saw in Poland, after some years of government, uh, the opposition was, was able to, to find another path. So, I mean, we have to be confident in, in people who are voting and, you know, who are able to, uh, to choose differently. But it's true. And if you look at Europe, for instance, I mean, a lot of nationalistic countries have been building up and we have a lot of governments and coalitions now with the far right. And that never happened before. So is this something that you're concerned about, this movement towards more nationalism that we see in elections? If I don't betray your thoughts. No. Oui, alors, euh, well, euh, Monsieur Akita and then Isabelle. So, uh, I worry more about the fragmentation of the global world order uh, rather than uh, rising, nas rising nationalism in each, in, each, in each individual state is a very serious problem, but uh, I worry more about the, you know, uh, defragmentation of the international system through the next year's series of elections is more serious. And uh, maybe people sp speak about multipolar, multipolar, but the polar means you have a polar, right? US, Europe, and maybe China or hopefully Japan or India, polar. But the maybe world will be more like a multi-universe Without the without a strong power, mm -hmm. but the universe mm -hmm. universe coexists together mm -hmm. without any order. Mm -hmm. That is, that is more dangerous. And and that was a big concern of the two round tables we had this morning that are really interesting. Saying it was it was time those elections are also a time to pull together and find out what are our common objectives and what is the world order you need to rebuild on the economic side but also on the yeah. political side. Isabel, you no, no, but uh, the, the question of uh, disinformation, I, I do uh, really agree with you. It's really frightening because uh, what we see today is um, each time when you have two parts, it's uh, just, I mean, the disinformation has uh, absolutely, uh, is overwhelming. I mean, the, the, the facts today are less important as the, uh, as, uh, the, the perception, the emotion, and the ideology, we, we, I mean, we just have, the, the last example is, is absolutely obvious between Israel and Hamas. I mean, depending the, the place where you are in the world, you just don't see the same images. And um, so the, the, it, it, it's very, very hard to, to counter disinformation, but also uh, it's very, very hard to, um, I mean, to, 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 to counter the, um, the rapidity of the information, uh, the um, emo emotion, which is uh, uh, driven by the in, the in the social area and uh, and on the internet, you, you, it's not audible anymore. And of course, this leads to more extre extremism in each part of the world and on every subject. Well, thank you. Uh, we've touched a lot of ground, a lot of different topics, and it was a. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much all for being here this afternoon and thank you to our panelists.